Hello, this is C. Marshall with another episode of Talking Backwards, a series of retrospective looks back at games. I have a deep love for a good, single-player focused FPS game, a concept that seems to be dying in favor of a more social, competitive approach. All self-proclaimed innovation in the gaming world currently seems to just be born of sprinting as far away from the zeitgeist as possible. And if you can only define yourself by what you're not, there's a clear problem. The few noteworthy entries that have come out recently in the shooter genre, at least, are either sequels, remakes, or just honest imitations. But it's upsetting what modern developers have decided to draw blood from. Some of the most exciting breakthroughs and refinements from the early 2000s have largely gone extinct. One of the games that made brilliant strides and didn't quite reach the level of innovation that its peers of this time period did was Fear, or First Encounter Assault Recon. Fear came out in 2005, and it shows. This was during the explosion of Japanese horror here in the States, and realistic physics in games, especially ragdoll physics, were just starting to become commonplace. So some developers were just going crazy with the spectacle. And playing the game today is a mix of refreshing bliss and that sadness of hindsight that you can sometimes feel. As a start, a huge part of the game, the horror, falls flat on its face now that the game has aged. It in part fails because of how tired the little girl with black needle hair has become, but more so with its execution. Monolith, the developers, wanted to keep a high level of tension through ambiguity. They are quoted as saying, predictability can ruin a scary mood. And this is absolutely true, but there is little ambiguity in their pacing, with all of the clearly defined now is the scary time parts falling exactly where the player expects. Just got done with a firefight? Have a scare. Walking in the dank back rooms of an office building? Have a scare. Entering the ladder animation? Don't forget to be scared. But you have to appreciate some of the subtler moments, with Alma quickly fading in and out of view at certain points. It also doesn't help that Japanese horror was such a temporary trend in American cinema. It was a silly and dangerous move to put most of their storytelling eggs in this basket, even though it did work a decade ago. The frequent, awkward sections of blurry, trippy effects are also at odds with the game's tension. The biggest mistake here being the addition of fail states to these sequences. When you lose here and are sent to a loading screen, the atmosphere that you had collected is immediately deflated. It can get tiring, and not because of the emotional exhausting, but because these repeated scare attempts keep having no payoff. Thankfully, the story does carry the game along at a relatively logical pace. The story starts out vaguely, and the game drips info in a pretty steady stream. It's actually an interesting tale, one of clones being controlled by a mysterious psychic and of corporate cover-ups and the like. It's told in a relatively unobtrusive way as well, and it gives meaning behind the locations you visit. There are also very few encounters with friendly NPCs, and this actually helps the tension, making you feel even more alone and against the odds. The twist at the end isn't very surprising, but the atmosphere is constructed well enough to keep things enticing. The thing is, the story is decent enough to make a damn good B-movie. And it does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is to validate your movement through the game. Beyond that, it just doesn't warrant much conversation. It's worth speaking about the scattered laptops and answering machines that spit some exposition at you. I really love when games include optional story bits like this in a manner that makes sense in the context, not just some text-filled journal you pick up somewhere. The star of the show here, though, is the gunplay, a relentless series of mini sandbox shootouts all ending in settling dust and mangled bodies. It's wonderful, and even today, it's some of the most visually stimulating combat you can find. The biggest success in the combat is the decision to have there be very clear set pieces with a static number of enemies involved. You are given a squad and a corridor and are asked to dispatch them in whatever manner you wish with the tools given. This design choice makes the linearity much more acceptable and understandable. The weapons all function solidly, even though there is nothing outrageously creative in your arsenal, but the game does allow for a ton of creativity in killing your enemies, mainly assisted with the player's ability to slow down time at once will, allowing you to subvert the soldier's line of sight, or shoot mid-air grenades, and so on. Every shot also registers a reaction animation from the enemies and the environment. And as mentioned before, this was right when physics were getting implemented in a major way in gaming. And Monolith just had a field to hear. The bodies flop around in exaggerated intensity, limbs are ripped off, and pieces of the environment will splatter, pop, and spray particles in brilliant fashions. It just baffles me how many games have avoided implementing these kinds 
times of visual responses to action in firefights. Plumes of smoke will obscure your vision, and they are certainly overstated, but it makes battle wonderfully chaotic. My largest problem with the game's combat lies in the looseness of the controls, and how dialed back the accuracy is in the game. The choice to have all automatic weapons fire in a burst with a single click makes getting headshots a chore, and fear never lets you keep a pistol on you for long before ammo dries out. Thank God for the stake gun, which is just a beast and probably the most memorable of Fear's weaponry, with the shotgun being a close second. There's also a really strange and slight lag in the response time between clicking and firing, but you quickly get used to it. It's still very strange. The weapons I found the most enjoyable were the ones that gave the most tangible feedback in terms of enemy response. The ones that are visceral, brutal, and still accurate. But I hated the particle cannon, which simplified combat far too much and lessened the importance of headshots, and it also just kept everything far too clean. Because the aftermath of combat is something to behold. Massive bullet holes with parallax effects to simulate depth, blood and limbs covering the ground, all cementing the fact that some serious shit just happened. A huge point of criticism in Fear's early days was the sterile design of most of its levels, predominantly being offices and labs. But I preferred these tenfold to the dilapidated corridors and warehouses of the other levels, because of how satisfying it is to enter a clean room and leave it in shambles. Fighting is just endless fun in the game. Even though it does need a bit more enemy variety, there are really only a few types of enemies, and this is excused by the narrative, but it's even more digestible because of the spectacular AI, which keeps the shooting lively and generally dynamic. If you hold down behind cover, they will lob grenades at you, they will flank you, and generally attempt to keep themselves alive and make you dead. Of course, it's not perfect with occasional stupidity or just bad pathfinding, but it's leaps and bounds ahead of most games even today. Something very cool is the fact that they don't always know where you are after they first encounter you. And added to this, they are constantly talking to one another. This pre-baked chatter isn't really intended for realism, but it's to allow the player to have more consistent situational awareness to combat the smarter enemies. The graphics themselves have aged pretty well. It looks very early 2000s, with stark shadows and shiny character models all over the place. But they're the least successful when not in modern architecture. The worn-down buildings look terrible because of how simple the 3D models are, with far too much detail in the texture work. But it doesn't help that there are pretty constant graphical glitches. The physics glitches are hilarious, but the graphical hiccups are less so. There were lighting issues, and sometimes explosions wouldn't have effects at all. Strange thing of that nature, I kinda decided to write it off as a problem with playing on modern hardware, because it wasn't built for it, but I honestly know nothing about how this stuff works. It really is a shame that the franchise took one hell of a dive after the first game, and looking back on Fear is a bit of a sad experience because of how little impact on the market it ended up having. But why isn't Fear regarded as a classic? It came out in the same general time frame as Half-Life 2, Shadow of the Colossus, God of War, Resident Evil 4, and a myriad of others that are now considered major staples in gaming history. And it's a really impressive piece of entertainment that aims pretty damn high. It's great to play today due to the feeling of being so far removed from today's madhouse of a gaming market. But with the power of hindsight, it makes you kind of sad to see such a creative and bizarre AAA game get swallowed by such soulless sequels, which definitely cheapened the fear name. It also looked less to innovate the genre and more to carve a niche and refine it. Regardless, a few years from now, I don't think people will be talking about fear anymore. And I think that's because the horror aspect of the game, a huge part of what made it stand out in its day, has aged so terribly and fractured the feel of the game into two disparate parts. A thrilling shooter inspired by classic action films, and a shoddily implemented story inspired by trendy Japanese horror. Ultimately, Fear is an awesome game that I probably will not be playing again for a pretty long time. Thank you so much for watching.